Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you everyone for joining again another Dean Chat. Um, I've got uh, my beautiful new guest, uh, Dawood. Do you want to give a salam to everyone? Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Dawood. Uh, revert to Islam for the past almost three years now. You know, alhamdulillah, it's, it's good to get an opportunity to obviously discuss in a room with everyone here. There might be some disagreements, there might be some agreements, inshallah. You know, hopefully the truth manifests itself on all of our tongues, right? This is the important thing. But, uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. No worries. And then we've got Sunil, like usual. Salam up everyone, your favourite co-host, Sunil. Um, <laughs> it's nice to have you back, finally. I, I've been in. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been captaining the ship for a while. So I'm, glad, I'm glad you have. And uh, you can keep the ship. Uh, <laughs> uh, but alhamdulillah, um, inshallah, today we've got an exciting new uh, podcast. I think you hear it a lot more about madhabs. Mm -hmm. What are madhabs? What's the point of them? Uh, should we follow them? Should we go to the sources direct? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I want to know what the madhab of the Prophet was. Um, mm -hmm. And then hopefully we can understand a little bit more. Because, do you know what? In the modern day and time, we have access to the Quran and the Hadith, right? Mm -hmm. What else do we need? I don't, you know, I mean, what else do we this need? This is the question, right? This is the question. Sometimes you feel like you maybe have too much information, right? I think it'd be easier a little bit if I didn't have access to so much, you know, it'd be easier to find a way that has less contention, right? But, uh, no, it's I mean, from my perspective, 13 years into Islam, only now I'm understanding the importance of following, you know, a, a specific madhab. And what were you on before? Yeah, so I was, I was kind of looking into it, but I followed my teachers as if, but now I'm kind of more into like, you know, going back to the sources, mm -hmm. you know, how I can take from that. Uh, what's the evidence for you know what Mama Buhani is saying? I think mm -hmm. uh, it's a natural progression that journey. So where you want to learn more, like you said earlier, yeah. uh, you want to be more like the Prophet I mean, like, you're going to follow that's his way. That's right. So, so. And, on, and on that note, Sidi, we bring you in oh, in regards you. to because I thought I think <laughs> it gives the viewers. <laughs> well, this is it. I think it's, it's good <laughs> as the lay people for us to understand what a madhab is. What's the origin of of the madhab, Sidi, and why can't we just follow the Prophet <laughs> Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. So the issue of following madhabs, I do not feel they would be contentious, differed over, problematic if they were presented correctly. You have misrepresentation on both sides. So those people who are anti-madhab, they will say things like, don't follow madhabs, don't follow Abu Hanifa, don't follow scholars, follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, if that was true, that those people who follow madhabs, they don't follow the Prophet wasallam. Think about it. What would what would that make those people? Prophets. Um, yeah, and teach. I don't know. They're making their own. Uh, Any person who says, "I don't follow the Prophet. I follow Abu Hanifa." Is that oh, Muslim or a yeah. kafir? Yeah, 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 I get that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You see, so. That's one aspect of misrepresentation when it's don't follow these people, follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If, you, if any Muslim genuinely feels when it comes to Islamic law, fiqh, we follow Abu Hanifa, not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's kufr. That's a massive misrepresentation. So Sidi, where does the Hanafi Madhab, the Shafi'i Madhab, the Maliki, the Hanbali, and the Zahiri and any other Madhab, where do they come from? So essentially, uh, any person who studies even a little bit and then reflects as well. Because the problem is when you just, whatever your teacher tells you, you just accept it without even reflecting or scrutinizing or thinking about it or researching or studying, you'll end up in these problems. Mm -hmm. But any person who's open-minded, they will very quickly realize that Quran and Hadith is sometimes really clear and not open to interpretation. And sometimes the Quran and Hadith, although they're clear, they are still open to interpretation. What's the greatest and clearest proof of that? The Sahaba themselves. The Sahaba differed regarding many issues. The Sahaba weren't saying we're going to follow Abu Hanifa Imam Shafi. They looked at certain verses of the Holy Quran, certain hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and they thought, oh, this could mean this or it could mean this or this could be understood in this way, it could be understood in this way. This hadith is pushing me in this direction. This hadith actually is um, telling me that this is the correct way of doing things. You see, it's open to interpretation. So in that case, so you're saying the Sahabas had opinions. Okay, we accept that. So which Sahabas were Hanafis? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> no Sahabi was Hanafi. It'd be disrespectful to suggest otherwise. And I, I know I'm going on a slight tangent. I become infuriated when people say, when uh, Sayyidina Isa Islam comes back, he'll follow the Hanafi method. I find that abhorrent. 
How can you say that about Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to go to Abu Hanifa. So just on that, could that not mean in a way that we firmly believe the Prophet Islam prayed or Abu, my, my, Abu, Abu Hanifa prayed like the Prophet Islam and he, that is the strongest evidence like that's how we are meant to pray or that's how that's the opinions that we are meant to follow mm. and Isa Islam will take that on forward. Yeah, but then don't say it in a disrespectful manner. Mm. You see, because for, for me to say, it's like uh, the same people who say that kind of thing. If I say Abu Hanifa follows my views, Mm. They'd say that's wrong, that's course, disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. You see? So why would I say Isa al Islam follows Abu Hanifa? I would say Isa al Islam would bring the haqq yeah. and we believe that the haqq is going to be in aligned with what Imam Abu Hanifa taught. That makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. The way you say things, especially when it when you're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm. the prophets, the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way you say something makes a huge amount of difference because we have the height of Adi. The city, you still haven't clarified. So we know none of the Sahabas were Hanafis. We know the Sahabas are different of opinion. We, I still can't get my head around where did the Hanafi madhab exist? Where did it start from? Yeah, so what, what happens when Quran and Sunnah is open to interpretation? You're going to have great scholars, starting with great scholars of the Sahaba who will provide interpretation. Okay. okay? So, you know, let's, say, let's give the example of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, he is one of the great Sahaba, he's one of the great scholars of this Ummah. So he's going to teach people. Sometimes he'll teach formal classes, very often he's going to be asked questions, he's going to answer those questions. Over a period of time, what's going to happen? You're going to have a body of religious verdicts coming from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala. When you bring all of that together, that's called a madhab. Because the madhab are, is a collection of the views and the opinions of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib or Sayyidina Abu Bakr or Sayyidina Aisha or Sayyidina Umar or Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. It's just a, a collection of their views and opinions with regards to what the Quran and Sunnah say regarding this issue or that issue. So, it's just a collection. Uh, if, if, you, if I understood that correctly, a madhab is the interpretation of our religion. This is what I was going to get onto. I mean, in a, in a bit more of a grassroots way, what is a translation of madhab? What does it mean? Uh, literal meaning? I mean, literal meaning is just a, a path you take, yeah. okay. madhab. But the technical meaning is, as I explained it, it's it's a, uh, a framework of interpreting Quran and Sunnah. So when, when we go on a more literalistic perspective, like you said, a path or a direction, right? Is it not implied that it's not about the the path per se, but the direct the the uh, location you're going to? And obviously, this, we're not talking about a physical location, but to go to the source of the Prophet Sallallahu to understand his Sunnah, right? I mean, is is does this kind of fall into the sort of area where it's like to to kind of adhere to the way as if that is the haq and not to realize that the the place that we're trying to arrive to through the madhab is the haq and this is just a, a kind of a mode to get there almost yeah the haq is quran and sunnah no doubt about it and this is why we will only have madhabs will only have uh, uh something to say when the, when it's open to interpretation mm -hmm. like we don't have a difference of opinion amongst the madhab is wine halal or haram Okay. Is swine halal or haram? We don't, because the Quran's really uh, clear with regards to that. The madhabs only have a role to play when the Quran and Sunnah allow them to have a role to play. You see, us an example of that. Uh, of what? From, from from the Quran when things are not very clear, and uh, an example from the Hadith when things are not very clear. Uh, you could look at it in very different ways, but let's look at Raf al Yadain. This is quite mm. contemporary. People. <laughs> How does Raf al Yadain? Uh, Raf al Yadain. Um, when you pray Salah, yeah. so in the Hanafi method, when you pray Salah, what you do is um, you simply raise your hands at the beginning and then you don't continue to raise your hands throughout the prayer. Whereas when it comes to uh, the Shafi method, for example, they will continuously throughout the prayer raise their hands. So they raise their hands at the beginning, then when it's time to bow, ruku, they will raise their hands again, time to go to sajda, raise their hands again. That's called Raf ul Yudain, literally raising of the hands. You see, so um, this is a matter of difference of opinion. Different Sahaba had different views with regards to this. Why? Because you will find hadith evidence suggesting that the Prophet ﷺ did raise his Mubarak hands throughout the prayer. And you'll find hadith evidence to suggest that the Prophet ﷺ only done so at the beginning. And you will have find different Sahaba holding different views. Mm. So, as far as the Hanafis are concerned, the established opinion from Sayyidina Ali, when Sayyidina Ali describes the prayer of the Prophet he doesn't describe it as constant Raf al-Yudain. 
You see, we have Hadith, we have a Sahabi. So he went with that opinion. You have some other Sahaba who have a different view that the Prophet ﷺ did. The point is, there, there are a lot of different Hadith that speak about this issue. And then the, the, the scholars, they have to look at it and they have to analyze it. And then they have to understand what the sound, uh, what they believe to be the, let's put it this way, the final action of the Prophet ﷺ. I'll give you a very quick uh, example, um, which is um, a lot easier for everybody to understand. Did we as an Ummah used to pray facing Jerusalem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we as an Ummah used to pray facing Mecca? Yes. Yeah, both of those occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, Every Muslim knows which one occurred first yeah. and which one occurred second. And what was the final practice of the Prophet ﷺ? Was it praying Jeru uh, facing Jerusalem or was it praying facing the Kaaba in Makkah Sharif? Everybody knows that. The point is it's not always that clear. Certain issues, it's not crystal clear exactly what the final action of the Prophet ﷺ was. But Sidi, that's, even that's confusing. So <clears throat> if, if Allah wanted to guide us, he gave us Islam and he gave the Prophet Islam to follow. So why is it so complicated in different opinions and interpretation? Because then, you know, why can't I interpret? Why can't I pick up the Quran and start interpreting from today? <laughs> that, that's a heavy question. I'm sorry. It's a good question. <laughs> but I mean, the reason I'm laughing is because you would be you you would be in a better position Sorry. to <laughs> you'd be in a better position to answer than I am. Any person who's honest with themselves, they will very quickly realize they can't. Like for example, right? If in a single day you yeah. read the entire Quran from beginning to end, is that very likely? It's not very likely, is it? I mean it could happen, but even if in a single day you read the entire Quran and at the end of the day I asked you a question regarding something you read earlier in the day. Is it necessary you remember it? No. no. So, if you are going to derive legal rulings from Quran and Sunnah, you need to know Quran and Sunnah in incredibly well. It needs to be right there in your mind, really, really clear. I often say, um, uh, even if you think about the average person who memorizes the Holy Quran, do they memorize the entire Quran to the same degree of clarity? Or are certain parts of the Holy Quran clear in their mind than others? Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Forget Hafiz, yourselves. You've, you, we've, we've all memorized portions of the Holy Quran. Say you've memorized Surah Yasin. Mm -hmm. Verse 57 in Surah Yasin, do you know it as well as you know Surah Fatiha? No. Mm -hmm. no. Surah Fatiha is right there in your head. If I were to say to you, uh, does Surah Fatiha have the word Deen in it? You could very quickly say to me, yes. Okay. If I were to ask you, does Surah Yasin have Fir'aun in it? You see what I mean? So not only must you memorize Quran and Sunnah, if you're going to derive legal rulings, you need to memorize it so well, it's right there for you. You but, see, because you need to draw upon. Could the, could the counter argument be, I've got a copy of Sahih, uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari, my Muslims, uh, Hadith collection and the Quran, English translation, I'm good to go. Yeah, we'll say no pro. We'll say there are so many issues with what you're saying. Let's say we'll ask this brother, uh, what time does Dhuhr start? Okay. Mm -hmm. So in order to answer that question, what's he going to do? Look at the hadith. He's going to have to re know every hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, inside out. He needs to know it, right? Because can we wait? Uh, a month for him to read it all and make sure he's made all of his notes on what time Dohar Sa'i right? And there's Dohar Sa'i time before we get out. Yeah. You see? Um, but and see, he needs to do, do the same with the Sorry to cut you in there, but do we not have had these, uh, you know, uh, actions about their intentions? Mm. So we're making effort to find Salat al -Dohar. You know, we've got Sahih Bukhari in English, we've got the Quran in English, so we've made effort. Yeah. You know, and Allah is forgiving and merciful, so, you know, as long as we make an attempt, it could be the first shadow, sir, third yeah. shadow, or the fourth shadow, you know, make one up. <laughs> You know, we just made that we have good intentions. God will reward us for that, no? I will reward you for good intentions. Won't reward you for not fulfilling the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, we'll ask, we'll say, look, the students of the Sahaba, when they were studying with the Sahaba and the Sahaba were telling them, Dhuhr starts this time, this is how you pray Dhuhr, this is how you pray Asad, this is haram, this is halal. What were they doing? Were they saying, hold on a minute, Shaykh, I'm not quite sure here. Let me go and read Bukhari Musa. Obviously, it didn't exist in that time. Let me go and gather hadith. And until that time, I'm going to keep eating this thing you were saying is haram. 
or I'm going to refrain from praying dhuhr until I've worked it all out. What were they doing? They were saying, okay, these people have knowledge. They are genuinely credible. We're going to follow um, what they've taught us. And yes, they're going to study at the same time. At a certain point, they come across a verse of the Holy Quran, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They feel this contrast with what the teacher taught. They're going to put it to the teacher. Here's a question. Like you said, it's things that contrast with the teachers, right? Is it, I think this is something that you know, I experience a lot in kind of like my day-to-day -day life of just, you know, you see a lot of hadiths on social medias, you see a lot of snippets here and there. Mm. What happens when you see a clear hadith, sahih, that is, it is not up for interpretation? Obviously, I'm reading it in the English language, so I, I don't have the, yeah. the Arabic origin to it. But it stands in contention with what's done or what is recommended throughout men. And I'll, I'll give an example because this hadith, it, it really kind of put me in a position of where I don't know what to do. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith talking about praying, keep your shoes on when you pray. Mm. Don't pray like the Jews or the Christians. Mm. Right. And so, you know, all over the place, you know, I'm facing, I'm going around to brother's house. They're saying, oh, you know, uh, you got to pray with your shoes off. You got to take your shoes off. And this sort of this sort of uh, kind of conversation um, or you shouldn't pray with your shoes on because it's just a concern whether or not there's no just on your shoes, these kind of things. When you take a hadith like this, there's really not much discrepancy in it, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite clear, it's quite straightforward. Yeah. What do you do in this position? Uh, the only issue you could have, you don't, you don't, but I, I want to address it as, as you know, in, the, in, in light of um, difference of opinion views. The only issue you could have with such a hadith, if you had a hadith elsewhere where the Prophet ﷺ said, don't pray with your shoes on. You see what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. then you'd have to work out, okay, why did the Prophet say it this way? And then why did he say it this way later? Why was this the instruction? And then this was the instruction. Yeah. You see what I mean? Here, you don't have that issue. And this, you know, at the beginning, I said, we have extremes. We have certain people who say, don't follow madhabs, follow the Prophet And that's one extreme. There's the opposite extreme. The opposite extreme is, follow what Abu Hanifa says, don't look into Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Who said that's right? Yeah. Abu Hanifa never in his life said, listen to me, you're not allowed to read Quran and Sunnah, don't uh, any of you bring hadith to me. It was completely the opposite. Yeah. Imam Abu Hanifa was sat there teaching scholars, Okay, the primary circle of students around Abu Hanifa were huge scholars, huge muhaddithun amongst them. Abu Hanifa didn't say, Abu Yusuf, you're a hadith scholar, don't mention hadith to me. It was quite the opposite. They were bringing me hadith. They were challenging him with hadith. No. So, you know, there's a famous saying that a lot of people quote this, right? When Imam Abu Niba said, if you find a strong hadith, that's my opinion. Throw my fatwa yeah. on the walls. Mm -hmm. what, where, like, what's the background behind that? What's the context behind that? Because I feel like people say that. So that, does that, that makes me feel, okay, if I see Rafa Dain being a stronger hadith, I should really follow that yeah. and not Imam Abu Niba. Mm. Yeah. So we'll say, again, we'll say, do what the... Uh, to, uh, the students of the Sahaba would do with the Sahaba, do what would the students of Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi and others would do with them. So if I find a Sahih Hadith that seems to contradict the Hanafi Madhab, what am I going to do? I'm going to ask the Hanafi Madhab, excuse me, what do you have to say about this Hadith? Because it's strong and it's going against what you're teaching. So, so, so I'm going to interrogate it rather than without... It's only fair that you go back to the person and you say, forget madhabs for a moment. Some teacher, some sheikh teaches you something. You find a hadith that completely goes against it. You should give him the opportunity to explain himself or correct himself. Because if you don't go back to him and say, sheikh, you said this is haram. Verse in the Holy Quran says it's halal. You need to give him that opportunity because either you've misunderstood the verse of the Holy Quran or he can tell you that this is actually explained in this verse of the Holy Quran or most importantly, he's just completely wrong. So if you don't go back to him, how's he ever going? And he's just going to keep teaching people the wrong thing over and over again. So with uh, Abu Hanifa, of course, when we find a Sahih Hadith, and it seems to contradict the opinion of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is not over the Hadith. Abu Hanifa is subjugated by the Hadith. And he must be. Any person who believes Abu Hanifa doesn't have to consider Hadith, you're misguided. You've so, got nothing to so do I with it. I think I'm getting this now. So at the time of the Prophet if there was any uh, disagreements or questions, they would go to the Prophet for clarity. And Allah will clarify the matter directly with the Prophet or the Prophet will clarify the matter. So that makes sense. So difference of opinion actually mm -hmm. started with the Sahaba. 
Yeah. Because when when the Prophet وسلم, says it's this way, there's no room for interpretation. Yeah. Gotcha. And the thing is, is the Madhavs came along to take the interpretation of the Sahaba, because you always hear Salaf, don't you? Mm-hmm. People say yeah, follow yeah. the Salaf. Salaf's so Salaf, I guess yeah. I guess what the Hanafi that the Madhav does is protecting the Salaf's opinions, like Sheikh said, uh, Sayyidina Ali's, you know, opinion on matters. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then Dawood gave a good, good, interesting point. He picked it up a hadith regarding uh, keeping your shoes on while doing. So yeah, I should answer that. So, one second, Sidi. So, so are you saying that what Dawood should have done is instead of interpreting it himself, mm-hmm. he should have gone and seen what the madhabs say, or an understanding of that hadith? Yeah. Well, also, what happens if, sorry, yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. what happens if the madhab stands in contradiction to this hadith? Yeah. It's clear, right? And, and on top of that, I think I'm not saying I'm not making a positive claim, but by virtue of saying pray with your shoes on, yeah. is it not implied to not pray with your shoes on? Does that make sense? I, you know, I, I don't know if if that can be if you can you know make a positive claim like that and say, hey, look, it said pray with shoes on, so you can't pray without your shoes on. Yeah, you know, some yeah, people say it might be right. Yeah, that's a valid uh, consideration. There, no doubt about it. So, um, what I would say to Brother Dawood in that case is, when you find that hadith, go to credible Hanafi sources. And I'm I'm going to encourage people, I always do, study with different people. Mm-hmm. You will find Hanafis who will completely misrepresent what the madhab is. And what was I saying earlier? Um, you've got extremes on both sides. Yeah. One of the extremes here is certain people who are supposed to be Hanafi, they will tell you, don't bring me hadith, I'm going to get, tell you what Abu Hanifa says. Yeah. Um, Abu Hanifa knew the hadith, right? Or when case. you follow a madhab, we're not interested in evidence. Yeah. I'm sorry, you don't know your own madhab. So, mm. Sidi, can I come in there? Okay, so now this is making sense because I'm getting the layer now. So now that we know that the Sahaba uh, taught specific individuals, mm-hmm. right? So Sahabas who had students. So all of a sudden we know that you got to be licensed in order to give fatwas or give interpretation of the of the Quran. So there's this, I don't know if... Like you need to be cha- qualified. Qualified. Yeah. So there's a chain. So whatever you say is backed by the Sahaba, is backed by the Prophet, and is backed by the Quran. It's so, always on the authority of... Oh, right, exactly. it's related. Like, on the authority of this person so, saying this. On, this on, what, on yeah. that case, Sidi, can you break it down for us? Because now we're trying to really navigate who are the authorities, I don't know, in the Hanafi matter, for example. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to answer this quickly and I'm going to come to that, okay? So, uh, this is why I, I encourage people to have multiple teachers. You might go to a Hanafi and you present him that hadith and he's going to say, no, 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 but in the Hanafi matter, you're not allowed to pray with your shoes on. He's completely wrong. Yeah. He's completely wrong, okay? And this is why you need multiple sources. If you go to a Hanafi scholar who actually has knowledge of the Hanafi method, he'll say, yeah, this is fine. Is it sufficient for someone to, in that situation where they answer, just Abu Hanifa said this, so this no, is what we exactly is, You came with the hadith. Mm-hmm. You, you, your position is, I'm confused about the Hanafi method because there's this hadith. Okay, mm-hmm. You come to me, I'm going to say, there's no need to be confused. This What the hadith says, that's what the Hanafi method says. Hanafi method says, you are permitted to pray with your shoes on. Mm, I see. Yeah. This is where we get and they quote this. the hadith in their books. Okay, so this is important because I think, you know, oftentimes, and to kind of get onto it, and we'll, maybe we'll pick this up later, this is where it comes into that contention with what I've experienced, right, which is a lot of cultural baggage to yes. certain areas and yes. certain populations, right? On top of that, and you know, this is, I think this is really important. We had this conversation offline a long time ago, which is, you know, how do you verify if a teacher's giving you the right answers? Yeah. One of the things that you stipulated and it helped a lot is, you know, if anybody tells you anything, if you want to look for the people that give you the evidence that's following it and the argumentations for it, and who are the people who've essentially mm-hmm. logged this argument and said it's a credible argument, yeah. right? Yeah, this goes on to what Sayyidi Ridwan was saying, you know, where where is the authority? Yes. Right? Yes. What yeah. authority? What yeah. are they and who made them the authority? That's yeah. the other question too, right? Because yeah. everyone knows yeah. Ibn Masul, all, all of these people, right? the great the Sahabas. Sahabas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows these people. Say, mm. We know they're great. But, you know, past these generations, how do we know these people? Who's given the sign mm. off, essentially? Mm. Yeah. So, um, Yeni, uh, let's just uh, review. So... Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's trying his best to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's gathering hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's looking at the Holy Quran and he's giving answers based on that. Now, Abu Hanifa might be right, he might be wrong. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Abu Hanifa, he was surrounded by scholars and if they felt he went wrong, they would tell him. Correct. So we believe you're wrong here. Where was he physically located, Sidi? Kufa. Kufa. And then Baghdad. Which is in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Quite far from Medina, no? Yeah. 
Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We can discuss the hadith element later, inshallah, as well. Okay. But they would tell him. They wouldn't just, oh, it's bad adab to disagree with your shaykh. They believe he's gone against the Prophet unintentionally. Is it bad adab to say to somebody, look, the Prophet said this? No, they were not like that. That's problems we have nowadays. People are unwilling to say, Shaykh, consider this. Shaykh, what do you say about this? They're unwilling to uh, challenge, if you like, respectfully. That wasn't the case with Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa changed his mind on many, many issues because either there was a hadith that he didn't know that come to him, but more likely he already knew the relevant hadith and the ayat of the Holy Quran, but there was a different way of looking at it. The two main students of Abu Hanifa, uh, Muhammad al-Shaybani, Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah um, It's estimated, it's an estimate, but a lot of scholars say they differed with Abu Hanifa up to a, th uh, up to a third of all rulings. So, so, so they were really disrespectful then, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, Abu Hanifa didn't seem to think so. Okay, so you can... He encouraged it. So you can be critical thinking. You can have a critical thinking. Yeah, by... based on? Evidence. evidence, evidence, not I feel this, this is what makes sense to me. Who cares what makes sense to you? This is not the deen of your head. This is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can I come in? Who's the teacher of Abu Hanifa? Abu Hanifa had many, many teachers, but you're probably referring to Hamad. Okay. Now, but he had many, many teachers. Asiri, who's Hamad's it's teacher? From, uh, yeah, you have uh, Ibrahim al Nakhai. Ibrahim Nakhai's teacher. <laughs> um, Al Qama. And who's Al Qama's teacher? <laughs> Ibn Masood. And who's Ibn like Masood's teacher? Rasulullah. Okay, so there's a chain there. There's a chain. But this chain, I know it's mentioned often, but this chain can become overly simplified. Okay. You so, see? Sorry, did because you... Abu Hanifa had so many teachers. Who wanted one teacher? Okay. So Imam Abu Hanifa is from the Salaf? Yes. So he's from Without the... doubt he's from the so Salaf. So he's a Tabi or Taba Tabi? According to uh, the stronger opinion, he's from the Tabi'een. But even if you went with the weaker opinion, he's definitely from the Tabi'een. Tabi Tabi'een is the second generation. Yeah. Tabi Tabi'een is the third generation. There's no doubt he's from the Salafi. Sorry, so can I only refer to myself if I follow Imam Khalifa as a Salafi then? Yes. True Salafi. <laughs> no, true Salafi. An actual Salafi. Because a lot of brothers who call themselves Salafi nowadays, yeah. they follow some contemporary scholar. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So, Sidi, can I just understand something? So, automatically, okay, now I know when I hear the name Abu Hanifa, he is a credible individual who studied under individuals who studied under individuals of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. So, all of a sudden, now when I have a hadith regarding uh, wearing my shoes or not in salah, I can see what Abu Hanifa says. His... Yeah, but he still has to justify it. That chain is not enough. Okay. He can't say, I'm the student of the student of the student of the student of the Prophet, whatever I say goes, no. I think this is oftentimes some, something that seems a bit problematic because there's this inclining to authority. Yeah. You know, I hold this position or Abu Hanifa holds this position. Authority so, is okay. Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. Authority yeah. is Quran and Sunnah. You could be a Sahabi mm -hmm. and a fellow Sahabi can say to you, you've gone against this hadith. Yes. Yeah, but I'm a Sahabi. So now what could became Khalifa, what happened? Yeah. Immediately he made a decision, almost all of the Sahaba were saying we disagree. Yeah. What now this is important. So now Bakr didn't say, Do you know who I am? Could he have said that? He could say. This or that Shaykh can't say. Even Abu Hanifa doesn't have the right to say, do you know who I am? He doesn't have that right. Because he's not mentioned in hadith. Yeah. Some people will claim he is, but he's not mentioned in hadith. Okay? So he, he, he doesn't have a right to say, do you know who I am anyway? Abu Bakr can say, do you know who I am? Because he is praised in the hadith yeah. constantly. Sidi, can I come back to that? Sorry. Okay, so this making sense. So why is the school which follows the Salaf, follows the Sahaba, named after Abu Hanifa? Hmm. I mean, I suppose that's just for identification purposes. You could call it anything. I mean, if, you, if all Hanafis right now decided we're not going to call it the Hanafi Madhab, we're going to call it the Salafi Madhab, no problem. But it's one of those things when something is, something picks up a name yeah. over time, yeah. then unless you use that name, yeah. it's going to be confusing for people. Sure. I'll give you an example, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Mm -hmm. if, instead of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, for the rest of this recording, if I started to say Abdullah bin Uthman, mm -hmm. you're not going to know who I'm speaking about, but that is the actual name of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. 
نعم if instead of Sahih Bukhari I started to say Al-Jami Al-Musnad Al-Sahih instead of Sahih Bukhari you're not going to know what I'm talking about so it's just you know should it have happened should it not have happened that's a different discussion but the point is that's the case okay so the story I'm not taking all these questions right so I think there's a book regarding the Prophet's prayer such a good book right it teaches you authentically how the Prophet has prayed right and in that book it references Sahih Al-Bukhari regarding the Rafa Diyadayn lifting up the hands so um because we've got Sahih uh, yeah, Sahih al-Bukhari mentioning the Prophet Sallallahu lifting up the hands and the Sheikh, Allah bless him, is I think is a Syrian Sheikh who uh, created that book. He only takes authentic hadith and you know he's verified these authentic hadith. So that means we should be praying like this Syrian Sheikh recommendation. Uh, we should be praying according to how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed. This particular Sheikh, he's looked at hadith and he's come to a conclusion that he feels this is how the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Abu Hanifa done the same Imam, Shafi done the same Imam, Malik done the same Imam, Ahmad bin Hanbal. I'm sure this particular Shaykh, he will accept that Imam Ahmad had more hadith knowledge than him. Oh, yeah. right. okay, so couldn't you say he has more access because contemporary, he has more access to, to hadith yeah. and to all of it, rather than at that time where the travel was a bit of a problem, yeah. Imam Abu Hanifa may have not traveled as much. This or, is an uh, argument, yeah. yeah. This well. is an argument. I know people who are anti-Madhab, they make, it is one of the worst arguments they can make. I know it, convince, it convinces the lay person, yeah, yeah. okay? Because the lay person doesn't have, by definition, doesn't have knowledge of Islam. Yeah. But what I'll ask these brothers, what are you then saying? Your shaykh now, today, has more hadith knowledge than Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. Is that what they're saying? Because what they, what they tend to say is that the hadith were not collated until later on. Yeah. Therefore, it's only after they were collated people had sufficient knowledge of hadith. So, okay, Sayyidina Umar didn't have knowledge of hadith, Sayyidina Ali didn't have knowledge of it, your shaykh does. What kind of Salafi is this? That he believes his contemporary shaykh, who's not even from the Khalaf, yeah. let alone the Salaf, he has more hadith knowledge than the Sahaba? And the Tabi'een, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praise scholars of 2024 or did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praise the first three generations? What kind of Salafis are these? But to be fair to them, they're not saying that they know more hadith, they have access to more hadith narrated by, you know, reliable people. Mm -hmm. So whereas Imam Abu Hanifa was in Kufa, didn't get to meet few, all of the Sahabas, uh, whereas Imam Shafi did met more Sahabas, had more access to hadith, and like was going to Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he had a lot more access to hadith. Now, going down the line, we have for a lot more hadith compared to what was actually available to them. Yeah. So couldn't they base, base it on those hadith? Because the methodology is still the same, isn't it? Yeah. They're basing their madhab on the levels of hadith they can collect. Yeah. So let's make a super madhab with all four. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is actually goes on to a point. Right. Is that, okay, there's obviously contention in between different madhabs. So Nils brought a really important point, which is that, you know, the, the, the access to hadith has changed over time. I, you know, in my personal opinion, I don't know, and obviously this is not the, the religion of my opinion, but I don't know if you can just say because someone is born in a certain time that you automatically say they're as less capable than a person previously. There's probably a, a different argumentation for that. It's not just just because they're born in, let's say, the 80s or 90s that they're less capable. But I think when it comes to this strict adherence to a single madhab, let's say if, look, I follow the Shafi madhab, and the, the reason for it is because I, I found a lot of, and we, you know, we brought this up, cultural practices within the Hanafi madhab. But let's say there's something that I don't find or, you know, the evidence provided for this uh, this idea, this ruling is weaker in the Shafi Madhab. But Abu Hanifa strictly extended an, an answer on this to a point where you can almost, you know, say that this is probably the safest uh, decision oh. to go. Why can't I then in that position say, OK, look, I, sh I follow Shafi Fiqh for the majority of my decisions. I'll take that opinion. But look, the Hanafi Madhab has a very good answer on this. This is a more valuable answer. It seems like it has more so, so example, content. Yeah. example, when you go to Hajj, Mm -hmm. Right? No, yeah. And unfortunately, um, unfortunately, it's just because of space. You yeah. you touch people, you know, elbow people. So if you touch the opposite gender, mm -hmm. which is haram and you should never do, yeah. then hajj is sometimes uh, 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 difficult. Your this is really wudu. Wudu. Yeah, look, go. I, I what do you do a, in that situation? This is an interesting topic because the Quran is very clear on this, right? Listen, we're not talking about hadith here. The Quran talks about, you know, if you in, if you touch or engage with a woman, then uh, to, to purify yourself. All right. I mean, well, the Hanafis don't have that opinion. The, Hanafis say if, the Quran talks about if you touch or engage with a, if you touch or engage with a woman to purify yourself, right? Not not to the exact wording of this, but something to this effect. Why is the Hanafis, you know, why is, is Abu Hanifa in opposition to this almost? 
So, so it seems... Which, 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 who's right? The Shafi'is or the Hanafis? So does that mean, you know, if, if you even brush your wife... Yeah. Who who is you know? Uh, it's halal to you, yeah. Yeah. But the but the Shafi, it's not the Shafi method. It's what the Quran says, right? And it says, you know, I think this is where that contention comes in. It's like, okay, well, the Quran says it clear here. If there's a disagreement, you know, what is the source? Obviously, it's the Quran, no? Of course, hundred percent. What do you do in that scenario, Siddiq? Now, I would say, mm -hmm. if the Quran clearly says touching a woman nullifies your wudu. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing else, neither in Quran nor in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that would indicate anything different than any scholar, mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Mali, any scholar who goes against this is wrong. Yeah. Okay. And if, despite being shown that they are clearly contradicting the Holy Quran and they don't have any evidence for what they are saying, and they persist on it, then not only is that person wrong, he's astray. But that's the question, you see. The first question is the Holy Quran, did it explicitly and clearly say that, number one? And number two, is there anything else in Quran and Sunnah? First and foremost, um, the Holy Quran says, La mastumun nisa. Okay? La masa. This is in the Qira of Hafsan Asim. Mm -hmm. Okay. La mastumun nisa. I don't want to get too technical, but that's what it says in this Qira. So, La uh, masa isn't uh, the same as La masa or La misa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that mean no rubbing? Okay. So, uh, that uh, when you say La misa or La masa, that's just to touch. La masa is slightly different. You see what I mean? So if I were to translate it in English, um, one would, if you were to say, let me say, let me say, you would say touch. Okay? You translate it as touch. Whereas, la masa, no. Engage with, interact with women. It's not crystal clear. Okay? okay? Interpretation like so the point is, um, there's some room there. Mm -hmm. Add to that the fact that you have strong hadith, if I'm not mistaken, in Abi Dawood, uh, Muslim of Imam Ahmed as well, but you have a strong hadith, Hassan hadith, where uh, Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kissed one of his wives and went and prayed salah without renewing wudu. I think there's even hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praying and Aisha waking up and touching him whilst he was praying. Right. 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 The foot of the Prophet yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so, you see, this is one of the problems nowadays with being so um, so insistent that every issue has just one clear right answer and everything is wrong. That's the fundamental issue here that people believe that every issue has one right answer and everybody else is wrong. Well, if that's the case, why did the Sahaba differ? You guys now, 1400 plus years later are able to sit there and determine what is clearly the right view but the sahaba who were with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who understood quran better than anybody understood sunnah better than anybody they looked at those same issues and some said it's this and some said it's this so what's so special about you guys it's a difference of mm. opinion so in that case Siddi, can someone who's shafi'i take a ruling uh, a fatwa from the hanafi madhab or the other two madhabs yeah, a person can, this is called taking a rukhsa, okay. or taking dispensation. A person can take a view from another madhab. However, it has to be done in an organized manner, in a con uh, consistent manner, not disjointed. You can't just say, right. okay, yeah, just, you know, I'll just take this one ruling from this one madhab. It needs to be done. The scholars spoke about this. It needs to be done in a systematic. So, so what about so what about outside of the madhab? Because you know this is a point I kind of landed on earlier. That would you say, and this is a bit of a pointed question, would you say that anybody who is a scholar outside of the four great scholars is not as uh, capable as by default is not as capable as the four great scholars because of the time they're born? Okay, so this kind of comes back to a question that was left unanswered earlier: Who makes somebody authoritative? Yeah. Okay. You get your authority, obviously, from your adherence to Quran and Sunnah. But who decides whether you are adherent to Quran and Sunnah? I, all four of us could sit here now and say, I'm adherent, I'm adherent, I'm adherent. That's meaningless. You need who, knows it. Yeah. yeah. So 
if somebody is praised in Quran and Sunnah, fine. We know Sayyidina Abu Bakr is adherent to Quran and Sunnah because he's praised in the hadith of the Prophet. But how do we know Abu Hanifa is? How do we know Sahih al Bukhari is filled with Sahih hadith? Like the, the Prophet didn't say so, did he? The Prophet وسلم, didn't say there's a man who's going to come, Muhammad uh, bin Ismail, and he's going to write. They didn't get it from the Holy Quran directly. They didn't get it. So where do you get that authority from? Yeah. And ultimately, it's from the peers who review. Nowadays, you know, in Western society, they speak about peer review and such things. Peers that review the work uh, and the teachings of a person and then, uh, you know, subsequent generations. So, so, so why is Abu Hanifa authoritative? Well, we'll say he adhered to Quran and Sunnah, but that's you saying it. Who agreed with you? His peers, by and large. And then those who came up. So, so the unanimous agreement amongst the Muslim ulama yeah, more or less that, that, that Abu Hanifa is someone of authority and I like to, work, like to use the word license to give fatwas mm. in his own right. Is that correct, Sidi? Yeah. And in that the only issue, reason I have an issue with license is that's misused sometimes nowadays. They say Ijaz is licensed to teach. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that can, uh, and that's another subject entirely. That's it's massively misused. This is why ultimately it always comes down to evidence. If you can prove what you're saying, yeah. like me, I could have a hundred Ijazat in Hanafi fiqh, yeah. right? But if I say something that I can't prove from Quran, Sunnah, and the Hanafi works, yeah. What good is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and somebody who has not one ijazah in Hanafi fiqh, he can show me from uh, Rad al Muhtar, he can show me from Fath al Qadir, great works of the Hanafi madhab, that this is the position. And I say, no, 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 I'm bigger than you, I'm greater than you. That's nonsense. So, mm -hmm. Sid, you've just raised it there. It's a good point. So, you're talking about peer review. So, the, the two questions here the Hanafi madhab and all the other matters are their work in progress. So, they must interact with different rulings and continuously change views to the closest to the evidence. And my second point is, you've just raised it here, what are the literature, the mm. books mm. that are important in the Hanafi method, for example, and, all, and the other madhabs? They are, um, w I wouldn't describe them as works in progress, more, more, le more so active. Madahib are still active because new issues come along and they need a ruling, okay? Yeah. Is the computer halal or not? Abu Hanifa didn't speak about Bitcoin that. Uh, Bitcoin, yeah. okay, uh, organ transplant, yeah. new issues ar arise. And then people who are experts in the madhab have to look at what's in Quran and Sunnah, what's in the madhab, and have to try to apply it. Now, but in terms of, you know, issues that were around from the time of the Sahaba on, they are resolved. You know, should you do Raf al Yadain? Should you not do Raf al Yadain? What time does Asr start? What time does Aisha start? So many other uh, prawns, halal, haram, you know, many other issues. This was resolved a long time ago. And, and where are they? Where can one get that kind of information from? Yeah, so in terms of books of the madhab, um, you have books written by uh, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. He wrote a lot of books in the Hanafi madhab. Imam Abu Yusuf wrote some as well, but by and large, the madhab was preserved by Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. Mm -hmm. So he wrote a lot of books. Six of those books are called the books of Bahir or Riwayah. Okay. And, and those, you know, those give you the, the, the views and opinions of Imam Abu Hanifa and his students. So, Sid, you know these hadith Dawood and, and other people are looking into, mm. I don't need to interpret them or put my opinion on it yeah. or even look for the evidence because they've been discussed 1400 years ago by people. Is that, wait, sorry, is that not dangerous to say, even look for the evidence? Yeah, because you know, if someone said so, we just go, yeah, look, it's, it's said by the Hanafi Madhab. Madhab mentions it, so. No, but then you're blindly following yeah. something, right? So what's so, the problem with that? Because we, we've got it, Hanafi Madhab certified. But is blind following, is that okay? Would no. you, if, if someone, yeah, but if Abu Hanifa said to you, like, let's say you were in the, the timeline, he said, look, just trust me, you do it like this. I'll be Would like, you accept it? I'll be like, yeah, Allah, Abu Hanifa said it. Yeah, this, <laughs> yeah, this is a, I think this is where the a fundamental problem is, in my opinion. I agree 100%. If an answer is given without the, and to be honest with you, when it comes to the, the concept of following the Salaf, the, you know, I think it, it adheres more to just the structure of finding your evidence. If you find someone who has given an answer and then gives you the hadith and the evidence for it, this is following the Salaf, right? Do we not have, uh, in the Quran, mm -hmm. we listen and we obey. Two. Abu Hanifa listened to Allah's Messenger. Yeah, we so, will so then I'm safe to say I hold my, everything on Abu Hanifa's shoulders and I'm just going to blind follow him. It's not because like, Hanafis I, I, I themselves. Wasn't there, I wasn't there at the time. I didn't understand the, the, the language structure and the understanding. Abu Hanifa mm -hmm. did. So I'm good to go. I but all you're doing. 
Yeah, all you're doing is you're looking at related evidence, mm -hmm. and if it's for them, mashallah, any Muslim, when he hears a ruling, and then he hears a verse of the Holy Quran supporting that ruling, or a hadith of the Prophet he's going to be more comfortable yeah. with it, he's going to be happier with it, you see? Um, and any Muslim who hears a ruling from Hanafi Madhab or anything else and then finds a verse of the Holy Quran that seems to go against it or hadith, it's not going to sit right with him until he goes and gets the explanation. But see, and, and this, is, this is a problem I have, right? Because when you go to your doctor, mm -hmm. you take his statement, his testimony, sorry. You don't say, let me see your credentials, because he's been vetified by okay. the NHS and his job. So Abu Hanifa has been vetified 1,400 years ago. So this is matters of dunya, we're talking about matters of akhirah. You know, where you know, the guy's like, is that right? The, the example upon to Allah is, is, you know, is greater. You know, what I'm trying to say with that <laughs> is that my example is that if with a doctor, he is being vetted by the NHS, Abu mm -hmm. Hanifa has been vetted uh, by his peers. Mm -hmm. So therefore his view, his interpretation is sound. So if I stay with him, I'm best bet. When it comes to whether or not my illness is going to get better or whether or not I will spend an eternity in Jahannam, well, there's one of those which I'll put an absolute rigor to finding out the answer. One of those I, I'm happy to accept. But Allah says in the Quran, if you don't know, go to mm -hmm. people of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, but the, Abu does Allah says blindly follow? No, 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 but Allah says go to people of knowledge. Yeah, but they and need to relay the knowledge, right? Okay, just to, uh, do this. Knowledge. And I understand this, but just saying do this, is this relaying the knowledge or is this just, you know, someone giving the, the ruling out from what they discern is, uh, you know, the best evidence, the best evidence role, but right? You're, but you're, there needs what, to be the evidence what, what behind it. What you're saying, and correct for wrong, Siddi, is you're saying Abu Hanifa said to do this, but Abu Hanifa never did. He said, upon my understanding, upon what the Prophet said, it is X. So this is, I have no problem with this. Look, if, if someone were to come to me and say, look, Abu Hanifa said that because of this evidence and this evidence, this is the the most verified answer to this question, and, for sure. And so when I say that I take Abu Hanifa's view, I'm going to leave it to Abu Hanifa. That... But would you take Abu Hanifa's view if it was... Uh, you know, uh, bereft of the evidence. If it was lacking evidence, yes, it, would you just say, yes, yeah, I, I, yes, because I of his position? Because he is such a trustworthy, with integrity person, he will not fall short. Is he infallible? Right, exactly. So you can make mistakes. Yeah, that's why I'm. So there's a potential if, if you, you, could, if you could you could be following uh, something that isn't the truth. But the thing is, no, no, no. Because can, can I just ask you? Is this yeah. what I'm saying? There's a lot. Yes, of, is this what's called taklid? Is what I'm trying to do? Yeah. What? What is the? Where, what do we have space for taklid in our religion? Taklid. Blind, blind they translate it as blind following. Let me give the, the precise definition. Following a view or opinion without knowing the evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is called taqlid. Now, um, I'm going to speak about the, the discussion that's just been had there from the Hanafi perspective. Forget anything else from the Hanafi perspective itself. Mm -hmm. The Hanafis themselves, they said to follow rulings without knowing the evidence is not the optimal position. So it's not the preferred. No system. way! No way! No way! Uh, Sidi, no. just just that point yeah. without uh, acknowledging the evidence you just said, yes, Sidi. So following an opinion without acknowledging the evidence, knowing the evidence, knowing the evidence is not the correct way. But it's not the optimal. It's way. It's the optimal way. But I'm not saying we're denying the evidence. I'm saying. There's the authority who has said, I have seen the evidence. Yeah. So you don't need to see it? Yeah, what do I need to Okay, see? look, I, I saw a whale flying in the sky the other day. And you I know. trust you. I have eyes, I trust me. I trust you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, that happens now, whales fly. It's hard, I'll, so I'll, this, is, this is a position in, in like, and why is that the strongest position? Yeah, yeah. Right? So Hanafis themselves, they said, no, we're not saying just Abu Hanifa says it, go. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, they said, yes. If you hear uh, an opinion from a credible source, you can follow it. But what if that later on it's proven to you that this was actually incorrect? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have to make amends for it. It's not, oh, he said it, it's, it's fine. No, no, no. Um, so Hanafis were very clear. It's superior to know the evidence. Okay, And that was practically followed in their, in their books. If you just look at Hanafi books of film. Okay? So... Yeah, obviously you have those early books that I mentioned, okay? and then you have later books that came afterwards. Great scholars of the Hanafi Madhab tried to you know, codify what's mentioned in Quran and Sunnah and also the Fatawa of Abu Hanifa. But the point is, loosely speaking, you have three levels. Okay? You have what's called a matan, a basic text. You have what's called a sharh, a commentary, and then you have hawashi and, and uh, such things, uh, or larger commentaries, which are you know, a level above that. Okay? So, 
They were very pragmatic, alhamdulillah. At the basic level, they just gave you all the rulings. This is how you pray, this is how you fast, this is break your fast, this is break, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, the essentials. They didn't really delve into the evidence. Not because evidence is not important or required, but because they're trying to give you everything you need to know to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quickly. Now, that was level one, right? As soon as you go to level two, filled with verses of the Holy Quran and Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu these are books of Hanafi fiqh. Okay. You see, this is really, really important. This is one of the things that distresses me with regards to how the madhabs are presented and specifically the Hanafi madhab. We're not interested in evidence. We don't need evidence. My yes, Mulvi we... at one point said this and so I just follow what he said. And this is, I think this is like a particular, yes. I see this a lot, like with all due respect to the population in, you know, in this area, it's this, it's, it, this is the position, don't ask. And you don't even need to provide evidences. Almost. You should provide evidence. The, uh, the other thing, the, the, something else the two of you raised in your conversation, what if what Abu Hanifa said was bereft yeah. of Quran and Sunnah? Now, obviously, that's almost impossible because he has to explain himself. But no, 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 no let's just stick to that for a moment. It was bereft. Or uh, let's, let's, be, um, let's give a situation where it's more, um, more likely to occur. Not bereft, but he, there's a hadith he doesn't know. Yes. He knows certain things, but there's a hadith he doesn't know, yeah. okay? Or there's something, um, he's looking at it from a particular perspective, but others, uh, his own students or other scholars have said, look at it from this perspective. This is seems to be more in line with what the hadith is. Yeah. Who are going to be the first people to say, we believe Abu Hanifa is mistaken here? Not Shafis, not Malikis, yeah. not Salafis. His own students. Okay. And, the, and those who come after him. Yeah. They're... You know, uh, there is uh, nowadays online this big argument, Abu Hanifa didn't know hadith, Abu Hanifa didn't know hadith, which is a stupid argument. Did he That's achieve the, the stage of muhaddith though? Was he uh, By necessity. Well, I'll delve into that in a moment. By necessity. Okay. But um, the point is, I've been studying the Hanafi madhab for what, almost 25 years. Okay. I've only ever come across one ruling where Abu Hanifa got it wrong because of not knowing a hadith. Okay, Abu Hanifa, other times, we as Hanafis believe he got it wrong because the opinion's not his. We go with the Sahibain or you, you see what I mean? But that's for other considerations. It's for not knowing a hadith. Not knowing a hadith. Have I've only, only one? Yeah. And only one situation I've ever come across is Abu Hanifa, he said it's makru for a fasting person to take a cold shower, well, cold bath back in the day, uh, or wrap himself with a cold garment. Okay. 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 And then the Hanafi to relieve the, the fasting essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Feeling of yeah. The ex intense heat. He said it's makru. He didn't. He didn't go terribly wrong. He didn't say it breaks your fast or anything. But he did make a mistake. Hanafi madhab said there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he was fasting and he wrapped himself in a wet garment. Oh, you see? Okay. So what did the Hanafi say? No, Abu Hanifa knows better. No, Abu Hanifa know, understands it better. You don't know him. I said ah. On this issue, no. we're going to go against Abu Hanifa and we're going to say this is not makruh. Read Hanafi books of fiqh, they'll explain it to you very, very this well. Is, it is interesting that you, you say this because when it comes to makruh and certain things like this, I think there's, this is also one of my contentions is that with the, the, the Hanafi madhab, there's, I feel like, and tell me if this is right, the position is, if you abandon sunnah mu'akhada, it's sinful. No. Is that, is that not correct? No, this is... I feel like this is something that is often like, you know, if you abandon with of this is... This is with it is wajib. With it is, 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 oh, is wajib. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sunnah mu'akhada, uh, consistently, also, do you know? Uh, to, if you abandon sunnah mu'akhada consistently without excuse, it's sinful. It's sinful? Yes. Okay, so so this these things were not made ob obligatory upon us, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah has enjoined five prayers on us, right? This is, you know, this is one of the core tenets of Islam. No one has, like, you know, a, a debate over was it six, was it, you know, ten, was it? It's it's five, it's clear cut. Why would I be sinful for not adhering to the supererogatory parts of the religion except doing what is good and I can do consistently? It's, you know, not, it's highly unlikely for a person to become sinful for missing Sunnah Maqadah. It's possible, it's highly unlikely. Yeah, consistently without an excuse. Without an excuse, okay. So somebody says, look, at work I get half an hour for my lunch break, I just about manage to eat my food and uh, pray my fard of dhuhr. I consistently miss the Sunnah Maqadah. They will say, you're not sinful. 
Okay. There's a good reason for it. Yeah. You see what I mean? And when we say if there's a valid excuse, you can miss sunnah mu'akkadah, the bar is a lot lower than it is for fard prayer. Somebody says, I'm really, uh, really busy at work, yeah. so I'm going to miss my fard of duha. We say, no. Yeah. Okay. But if somebody says, I'm busy, it's really difficult, I'm going to miss sunnah, we say, okay, the bar is lower there. Yeah. You cannot, it's actually, as you said, you cannot treat sunnah prayers like fard prayers. You can't. Yeah, yeah. It's completely not. So, okay. I think we're going to now sort of get ready to sort of put the podcast to an end and, and summarise it. And I think we probably need a couple more uh, episodes on this topic mm-hmm. because I think it's a really interesting one. I think it's helped me today to clarify and understand that the Hanafi Madhab takes from Sahabas who themselves had difference of opinion. Yeah, can I time. just jump in here? Because yeah, on this, the Hanafi Madhab is actually a little different to some of the other Madhabs. In the Hanafi Usul, you will find the Hanafi Madhab and let me just speak a little bit about madhab before I come back to this. Madhab is not following one person. The only singular individual you are happy to follow is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No other sing, even with Sahaba. You know, if you have a Sahabi saying one thing, all of the Sahaba saying another thing, we're going to be inclined towards those others. You see what I mean? But the point is, uh, when you have a madhab, it's not one person, which I think, uh, based on our discussion, is abundantly clear mm-hmm. that it's a large body of scholars generationally. Generation after generation, they scrutinize, they check, they go back. But the Hanafi madhab does not allow Abu Hanifa to go against the Sahabi. Okay. What do I mean? So you have three possibilities. An issue is being discussed. No Sahaba ever spoke about it. Of course, Abu Hanifa is going to look at Quran, Hadith is going to give his understanding of it. An issue is being discussed and the Sahaba have already discussed it. They're all in agreement. That's called Ijma. No scholar on earth can go against that. Now, Imam Shafi, Malik, Ahmed, doesn't matter who it is, they can't go against it. Okay. An issue is being discussed, actually going to end up with four. An issue is being discussed and different Sahaba have different views. Okay. All Imams have the right to look into that issue and incline towards this Sahabi's opinion or this Sahabi's opinion. No problem. Like Raful Yadain, some said do it, others said don't. They have the right, they can research and they can incline towards one opinion or the other. Where the Hanafi Madhab is different is in this fourth scenario. Only one Sahabi spoke about the issue and he said the answer is this. Okay. okay? Can't go against this. Abu Hanifa can't go against it, according to the Hanafi Usul, which is different to other Madhabs. Okay. I'm not a Shafi, but my understanding is Shafi Madhab, Imam Shafi could actually disagree with that Sahabi. Because yeah, he said, look, I've analysed it, I've come to a different conclusion, there's only one Sahabi. Dis- Abu Hanifa is not allowed to go against okay. it. Okay, I've got a question. Yeah, go on. Just like on a concluding one, right? Um, let's say you've recently started to practice, uh, you've recently just become Muslim. Why should you become uh, someone who follows Madhab or become Hanafi? Um, and if you don't become uh, someone who follows a Madhab or become a Hanafi, what do you miss out on? Uh, I suspect you will go through a great deal of confusion if you don't end up following a Madhab. Because if you don't end up following a Madhab, uh, one of the four recognized Madhab, the reality is you're going to be kicked between a hundred different madhabs. This sheikh says this, this sheikh says this, this sheikh says this, this sheikh says the Quran and Sunnah says this, this sheikh says the Quran and Sunnah says this. You see, it's a lot simpler if you follow a madhab. I mean, even before we look at simplicity, if something's hard, it's hard, what we're going to do? But Alhamdulillah, here Allah Most High has made it easy for us. The point is, the Ummah has been following madhabs from the time of the Sahaba. Only four have been preserved for us, but from the time of the Sahaba, the Ummah has been looking at class, uh, uh, qualified scholars and asking them to interpret Quran and Sunnah for them. So if you follow one of the four madhabs, your life is a lot easier, inshallah ta'ala. And yes, when questions are raised, you should ask for evidence. And whoever's teaching you should have the ability to discuss evidence with you. And if they don't, then you need to find another teacher. I'm not saying dispose of that teacher you need to find another teacher and another teacher and another teacher until you have people who can actually explain things to you based on evidence right so what do you benefit you benefit following the tradition of the muslims from the beginning of time from the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu your life is a lot easier everything's a lot clearer it's not a mess it's not confusing okay. why should that be hanafi though you don't have to be Hanafi. You don't have to be Hanafi. You follow any of the four uh, credible madhabs within Ahl Sunnah. My advice, and it's not my personal advice, many scholars spoke about this as well. The best advice is whatever, whichever madhab is most easily available to you, follow that one. What does that mean? Not just I've got some Shafi, some Hanbali, some Hanafi. No, no, no. You've got uh, people who are at a high level in that madhab, not only the rulings of the madhab, they can link it to Quran and Sunnah for you. Um, and you have a number of them available to you. Mm-hmm. Now, whereas, you know, somebody says, 
Um, like I know people who, for example, they went to Yemen, Tareen. Mm. If I went to Yemen, Tareen, which I did uh, for about seven, eight months, but if I went there and I hadn't studied Hanafi fiqh, I would have become a Shafi. Mm -hmm. Because mashallah, the scholars there, they're knowledgeable people and they follow and teach the Shafi madhab. I wouldn't want to be in a place like that and follow Hanafi. Yeah, but I've got a teacher somewhere online or there's this one guy I study with. Why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? It makes no sense. So okay. it's a matter of availability. Now, obviously, if you've studied one madhab and now you want to study another and then you want to compare between the two and go with the one you're more, more convinced of, absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from a basic, just for a kind of understanding, when it comes to, to uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, his value that he ascribed to Quran and Sunnah, did he value these things equally or did he value one or the other? The Quran is superior to the Sunnah okay. according to everybody. Oh, yes. yes, but Imam Abu Hanifa had a particular way of looking at that. Like if he felt something is clear in the Holy Quran and he felt that a hadith contradicts it, he will try to reconcile. If he can't, he'll go with the Quran, he will leave the hadith. Okay. Okay. Inshallah. I think that was a great discussion. Um, what we would ask is our viewers to, inshallah, please comment, share and like and let us know if you want another episode exploring other madhabs or even continue the discussion with the Hanifi madhab. Um, or maybe Abu Hanifa and hadith and hadith more broadly. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I think we could. I think we should explore it and, and really bring some of these contentious people have nowadays. Inshallah. Um, so, Sunil, any last words? So, I want to thank you, Sunil Radin and Vidal for coming back and Dawood for joining us today. Dawood, any last part? Of the I think we covered everything. To be honest, I'm, really I'm not convinced on the Hanafi <laughs> method. I think off camera, I will. But I can definitely understand the value in it, and I think there's a. To be honest with you. It's demystified a lot of the sort of uh, cultural baggage I yeah. see with a lot of the Hanafi population around here. And, you know, I think that's that's an important thing, right? Because I don't want to have presumptions about a, a lineage of scholars based on just the people I've yeah. met, right? This is, you know, this is not the right way to go. And so, you know, it's important. And, and joking aside, it's not right to try to convince somebody to leave one mother and follow another. <laughs> you must have And any last comments from you? Last comments from me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all go fee. And um, uh, as essentially to reiterate what Brother Dawood is saying, look, don't base your deen on slogans or very superficial knowledge. Look into things in detail. Study with a broad number of people so you don't get just the errors of this person. Obviously, everybody, uh, every person teaches good things and also has mistakes. If you study with a broad number of people, then inshallah, you will not fall into that. Uh, you will not fall prey to their errors. Mm -hmm. now, because evidently, there are certain people who have re misrepresented the Hanafi madhab to yourself. Oh, okay. um, and, uh, you know, you, you've had the ability to speak to other people and that's clarified for you. So I think this is a real good takeaway from this is study with numerous people um, and study in more detail. Don't just rely on slogans. Mm -hmm. Follow Quran and Sunnah. Don't follow Imams. Well, what were the Imams following? The Torah and the Injil? They will follow <laughs> Quran and Sunnah as well. You see, so just scratch the surface a little bit, value yourself, more importantly, value your deen, and don't be so superficial about things.